Now, Trista, the last two nights, we've sat here talking about J.J. Redick. A little bit, a lot, depending on what it was. Basically assuming that the worst kept secret in the NBA was going to be that J.J. Redick would be the next head coach of the Los Angeles Lakers. And he was going to be the next Pat Riley, and everybody was going to love him. And the Lakers would be hiring their eighth coach since Phil Jackson retired the second time around in 2011. And then all of a sudden, Dan Hurley, out of nowhere, now becomes the at least the favorite. Whether or not this goes through, I mean, everybody's got their price. But I'm going to tell you this right now. All I can picture is Dan Hurley yelling at LeBron James at some point during a game in the regular season. I cannot wait. I thought J.J. Redick to the Lakers was going to be a circus. No, 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 no. This, I want all of it injected into my veins. I pray this happens. Oh, I'm so pissed, honestly. <laughs> like, I'm just, I, I got up out of my bed right as soon as it came out, and it's just like it does not make sense. And if you look at the historic component of this, what coaches in college basketball, especially yellers, have ever worked out at the NBA level? None. Mm -hmm. Like, none. Not Rick Pitino, not, not Coach Calipari. Like, the list really goes on and on if you go through it. And I think Dan Hurley is another, another coach that is just not going to be the one to be able to succeed at that next level. And on top of that, like, when you think of Dan Hurley and then you think of the L.A. Lakers, a family-run organization – Kind of cheap. Already got coaches on the payroll like Darvin Ham that they owe $8 million to. You're talking about their only revenue stream is from the L.A. Lakers. And all of the players that are on that team are just not Dan Hurley. Like, not Dan Hurley humans. Like, we know what he's looking mm -hmm. for. And he talks about how one player can become a cancer in the locker room. Well, when, when you're not the GM, what do you do when you have a cancer in the locker room? He's going to rip his hair out. You saw that with Chip Kelly as well, yeah. going from Oregon to the Philadelphia Eagles, and he had quite a bit of team control. That did not work out. Like The only thing that this feels like to me is Dan Hurley saying, I'm going to take my $60 million, mm -hmm. whatever it ends up being, $15 million a year for four or five years, and then if it doesn't work out, I'll go back to college and – everything will go back to being exactly the way yeah. that it was. Yeah, kind of the same situation. A little bit different because John Beeline was so old, but you remember yep. when he left at Michigan and he oh, takes the Cleveland Cavs job. That was a disaster. That and, was so bad. But, like, remember the Athletic had this. We were getting reports a week into the season that he didn't, even, like, at training camp and during remember the exhibition slugs, games, it wasn't working out. Slugs and thugs when yeah. he called oh, the, the yeah. team a bunch of thugs, and he was like, oh, no, I said slugs. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Now, that's a different example because he's old as hell. Like, yeah. He's in his yeah. 70s now, but it didn't work out, and that's what I was trying to think of a coach, the last coach that left the college game. It's Brad Stevens. And I'd say, yeah, Brad Stevens mm -hmm. was great. But he's, and like, a very calm, like, gentle. Different different kind of guy. Yeah, and he was like the X's and O's. I would compare him like kind of how Spo was. Like Spo kept working his way up. Like that's how Brad was. He was like a basketball geek. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. that worked. Um, but it does make sense for Hurley. You know, like you said, you get your money. A lot of these guys, you want the opportunity to at least give a shot, give it a shot in the NBA to go to that next level, get all the cash. And you know, if if you if you lead the Lakers to an NBA Finals, to a championship, you're a legend. Now you've won two national championships in college basketball. You made the switch. You made the uh, the the flop, I should say, over to the NBA. You win an NBA title. You're one of the greatest coaches of all time, if not the greatest coach of all time. Like but you're up there with the Phil Jacksons, the Pat Rileys of the world. You've done you, it on both levels. Don't you think, though, that trying to go for a three-peat and how historic that is is really important for a legacy, considering that the last person to do that was John Wooden. I do. Do you think that he's thinking, though, my stock's never going to be higher, and it's so hard just to repeat, let alone three-peat, yeah. that if I go back, you know, let's say we have a good season. Let's say we're the 15th-ranked team in the country. Or let's say we make it to the Elite Eight, the Sweet 16, and we get bounced, because it is such a fluky situation, the NCAA tournament with the one and done. I, I mean, your stock's probably never higher. You passed mm -hmm. all that money. You passed on that opportunity. But I think that, like, there's pros and cons. At UConn, in college basketball, you get to pick your players. You don't get to do that in the NBA. The total for game one, five and a half, minus 115 to the over. Yeah. What would be your look there? You think this is higher scoring or maybe lower scoring kind of feel-out process for game one? Pound that over. I don't think there's any feel-out process for these two teams. Yeah. I think it's going to be uh, pretty pretty wild right from the jump. Um, also, something to look out for, too. Matthew Kachuk and Sam Bennett played in Calgary for quite some time, and they built up that rivalry with – Edmonton in that battle of Alberta, and I think there's a lot of, uh, or, or no love lost between those two guys and Evander Kane and McDavid and Dreisaitl. Like, there's there's some hatred already. Um, 
which people might not really know just because it's Edmonton versus Florida. Like, what could those two really have to hate about one another? But but those things kind of last in the NHL. I mean, Calgary and Edmonton played in that series two years ago, and Connor McDavid won in an overtime in Calgary and sent the others to the Western Conference Finals. So that's probably in the back of Chuck and Bennett's mind a little bit. And, uh, you know, I think this thing is going to be a running gun game right from the jump. I, I would I would take the over in the first period over in the game. That's probably what I'm leaning toward when I put my picks down on Saturday. But, um, yeah, I think we're going to see a high-scoring game. I think a tough one to call is Kentucky-Oregon State. And on paper, like, yeah. if you're looking at it, it, like, it seems like you just play Kentucky because I believe they tied for first in the regular season in the SEC, which is the toughest conference in the country. But Oregon State... I mean, they look really good in the regional. Both teams played the minimum of three games, and they could hit the baseball. Who do you like there? Yeah, so all right, th- there's strategy that you can go about when betting these, right? So there's kind of three ways. You could bet, you know, game by game. You could bet who's going to win the Super Regional. And then tomorrow, you're going to see bets come out that you can bet over or under two and a half games, right? Yep. How many games the series goes. And this is one that where you bet the over two and a half games, because guess what? You don't even have to pick who wins that one. You just bet the over two and a half games because these two teams are very equal. Kentucky, much better pitching than Oregon State has. Quite frankly, that's what's gotten it done for the Wildcats all year long. They can just bring arm after arm after arm against you. They can hit too, but Oregon State's been a better team than Kentucky all year long. Kentucky's just kind of been a little more consistent. Oregon State had a pretty big dip there in the middle of the year in the Pac-12. So I like... Kentucky a little bit to get out of this. I do not sound confident because I am not confident. <laughs> but what I am confident is if you're going to play that bet of over or under two and a half games in the series because it's two teams, you know, best of three, first team to win two games, advance to the College World Series, bet this one over two and a half games. They'll each win at least one. Alan, I'm looking at this uh, Charlottesville Super Regional, looking at UVA and Kansas State, and it just on paper is a massive mismatch. Uh, UVA, we know what they're capable of, especially with those bats. Kansas State pitching is uh, its an issue. Big upset already. Uh, is this as big of a mismatch as it looks on paper? Yes, it is. Now, in college baseball, which is arguably the most volatile sport that there is, anything can happen, right? But it is tough to win series. If this were a one-game NFL playoff thing, Kansas State can handle its business, but when you have to win two and you have to do it in Charlottesville, and especially the way that Virginia played through their regional at home as well, like they know exactly what time it is. And you, we talk about like blue blood college basketball teams, blue blood NFL teams, right? Virginia is that in college baseball. They've been here before. They've done it. When you sign up to take a scholarship and play at Virginia, you know the history, right? Like they win titles. They hang them up. So it's going to be a fun series because Kansas State, they can throw some things at you that you haven't seen before, but Virginia is just much better, man. They're just a much better team, and they haven't shown any signs of stopping. Like, they they are just – they are consistent. They're not going to give you a game or a series. You're going to have to take it from them. 